Paul was on house arrest, alone. Yet, still, he wrote a letter with words of transformation, joy, purpose, and good news. If Paul did it, so can we. Let's find joy. Let's find purpose. There is truly good news. It's time. Let's press on. Well, hey, everyone. Uh, so good to see you. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Um, whether you're here at the Miller campus, thanks for being here. Uh, if you're out at Elkhorn, so glad that you're with us. If you're watching online, so glad that you're with us. Correction Center guys, so glad that you're with us. Um, it's just fun to be uh, together. Uh, if you don't know me or you're new, uh, my name is Blaze, and I am the high school youth pastor here. And it's fun for me uh, to be able to preach God's word every once in a while. So I'm really, really happy to, uh, to be able to do that today. Um, you know, I am really, really thankful for the series that we have been in called Press On. I'm thankful that we've been able to walk through the book of Philippians together. And I am so, uh, so excited for where we're going to be at today. Uh, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. And when Tim and Jeff told me that I was going to be doing Philippians chapter 2, I honestly felt bad for them that they, didn't, that they weren't going to be able to preach it because it's just you know, it's such an amazing passage. And so what I want to do before we read it together is I want to pray. So if you'll pray with me, uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. God, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for your goodness. God, thank you that you know every single person in this room. God, you know how their week's been. You know how they're feeling right now. And God, I believe that it is your desire, because you love them so much, that it's your desire to speak to them. So Father, I pray that for anybody in here or watching online or wherever they are, God, I, I pray that if anybody has any emotional walls built up against you, Father, I pray that you would break through those today. God, that your word would speak loud and clear today, and Father, that we would be changed by you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us. Um, we are here to, to bring you praise and honor. And um, yeah, we're excited to do that today. So God, we love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So like I said, this is like a top 10 passage for me. I love this passage. Um, and we're going to start in verse 1 and read through verse 11. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you have your phones, you can click there. Whatever's easiest for you. Um, but I'm going to start in verse 1 and it says this. It says, therefore... If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now today we are going to be working um, backwards through this chapter and I'm really, really excited to do that. Paul, in this passage, the thing that he wants us to know is that humility is essential. It's essential for unity. Humility is essential for unity. And I firmly believe, like down to the deepest parts of my soul, that we cannot understand what humility is if we don't know who Jesus is. You know, um, 
I grew up um, a Christian, grew up in a Christian home, uh, believed in Jesus at a very young age. And I had the idea that being a Christian, what it really meant was to just try harder, to try to do good things and to not do bad things. And God's love for me was dependent on whether I did good things or whether I did bad things. And as I was growing up, I noticed um, that I had a very, very prideful heart, very prideful heart. Now, to the outside, my friends and people around me, they probably would have said the opposite, which is exactly what I was trying to get them to think. I would do things, I would love people uh, so that they would look at me and think, man, wow, Blaze is humble. Like, he is a good dude. Like, that was my, that was my heart. And I realized that that was not okay. Like, that is sinful. I knew it was a problem. And so what did I do? I tried to get rid of my sin. I tried and I tried and I tried, but every time I failed. I failed and I failed. And here is why I failed. I thought that in order to fix my sin, to become a better Christian, to work on my sin, I thought that I needed to focus inwardly. How can I be better? What can I do? I had to work on my pridefulness. But the more that I have fallen in love with Jesus, the more that I have gotten to know the person of Jesus, I have realized that to become more humble, to become more humble, I don't need to focus inwardly. I need to focus outwardly. I need to be focused on Jesus. I need to stop looking at myself and think, how can I be better, but rather focus on the person of Jesus Christ. Because the more that you and I focus on Jesus, the more you and I will become like Jesus. And Christ is the perfect example of humility. He's the perfect example of humility. And so what I want to do today is I, wanna, I want us to not focus on ourself. Think about ourselves. But what I want us to do is, is to put our eyes on Jesus together. And so we start in verse 6. First part of verse 6. It says, who, referring to Jesus, being in very nature God. What you need to know, and maybe you already know this, but, but Jesus is God. Jesus is God, which means that that Jesus is eternal. There has never been a moment that Jesus has not existed. He always has been. He always will be. I think a lot of us tend to think about Jesus like like he had a beginning. And he began when he was born, right? He became a person when he was born. but, But the person of Jesus Christ has always existed. He's eternal. Jesus is all powerful. Jesus is the one that created the the earth and the heavens out of nothing. Out of nothing. Colossians 1.16, it says, For in him all things are created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus created our Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way galaxy has over 400 billion stars. And the one that our, uh, our Earth rotates around, you know, we call it the sun, right, is one of those 400 billion stars. And if you were to, if you were to start at the beginning of the Milky Way galaxy and go all the way to the other side of the Milky Way galaxy, it would take you 100,000 light years And to just kind of put that into perspective, one light year equals six trillion miles. And the Milky Way galaxy, it is one of two trillion observable galaxies in our universe. It's one of two trillion observable galaxies in our universe. Now we have eight planets in our solar system. Some of you might argue nine. I would be one of those. RIP to Pluto, right? Um, but our, our solar system has eight, pl- eight planets. 
And if just this last week, um, you could have actually gone outside and looked up to the stars and you could have seen the planet Mars. You could have literally seen the planet Mars with your own eyes. The planet Mars is 38 million miles away from Earth. And so the planet that you're standing on is created by Jesus. The planet Mars that you are looking at is created by Jesus. And the 38 million miles in between and the trillions of light years after that were all created by Jesus. Jesus also created every fine detail, like your DNA. Every single one of us has a unique DNA. And if you unraveled the DNA in your body, it would span 34 billion miles, which would reach to Pluto and back six times. And all of this is just a tease, like it's just a taste of the vastness of our universe, and Jesus holds it in his hands. Jesus is also perfect in his holiness. Meaning that Jesus is as far away from sin as you could possibly be. It means that he can only do what is good. It means that he always keeps his promises. It means that he is the object of all worship. Like literally right now as we are sitting here, as you are watching, there are hundreds of thousands of angels relentlessly giving Jesus praise. Because he is holy. Because he is different. Because he is set apart from us. Jesus is God. And then verse 6, it goes on to to say that, that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Another version says that, that he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, as something to be held on to. And this verse, it, it speaks to the humility that Jesus had before he came to earth. Jesus has always been humble. And it's that humility that drove Jesus to earth. I mean, I think about that conversation that Jesus had with God the Father when it was time for him to leave his, his heavenly throne, his heavenly kingdom, and to come to earth. Jesus entered his creation in humility. It's not like Jesus was, was dragging his feet or throwing a temper tantrum, but he was ready to enter into his creation with humility. And Jesus had every right, he had every right to come here on earth and to rule and to reign. And in fact, that's exactly what the Jews thought he was going to do. They thought that in first century he was going to come and overthrow the Roman government. But he didn't. Jesus lived here humbly. He set aside all of his power, his authority. He let go of it. He didn't consider it something to be grasped. Verse 7 says, rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. By becoming a human, Jesus made himself nothing. Another version says that Jesus emptied himself. And this word empty, it speaks to the idea that Jesus didn't stop being God. I don't want you to misunderstand that when Jesus came to earth, he never stopped being God. But rather, he voluntarily chose to not exercise all of his rights as God. I compare it to Superman. When Superman became Clark Kent, it's not like he stopped being Superman. He just set aside all of his power, his authority. Jesus never stopped being God. I mean, think about the process of Jesus becoming a human. I mean, we can kind of laugh at this. I had, I had some fun with this earlier this week as I was planning. I mean, the one that made the vastness of the universe that is measured in light years was in a womb. I mean, think about that. Like, talk about being confined from universe to womb. Like, my wife Hannah is pregnant right now, and uh, we're due in December, and we're really, really excited But like our baby girl, it's not like she has a lot of room for activities in the womb. 
Like she is confined in there. She is restricted to her movement. Jesus, the creator of the universe, was in a womb. Let's think about this further. The one that holds the universe in his hand was held in the arms of his mother. The one that created the earth probably fell and scraped his knee on the earth. The one who designed our DNA, all of us uniquely made, he had to learn how to count. (laughs) He literally became nothing. And not only did he become nothing, but he became a servant. And it's this humility that led Jesus to the cross. Look at what verse 8 says. It says, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, the crucifixion was very, very gruesome. It was a brutal way to die. And even before Jesus was crucified, he uh, experienced emotional betrayal. Like, he, he came to save, and the people, his own people, the Jews, are the ones that rejected him. Judas rejected him, one of his disciples. Peter rejected him, one of his disciples. Before, even before Jesus was crucified, he was experiencing emotional suffering. And then it was time for him to be crucified, but before he was crucified, they flogged Jesus. The Romans flogged Jesus. And they used this whip called the flagrum. And this flagrum had like these leather straps. And on the, on the end of each of the leather straps, there were broken bone and pieces of broken metal. And they beat Jesus with it. Not once, not twice, not three times, but 39 times. To the point where Jesus wasn't even recognizable. So you just imagine Jesus being bleeding everywhere, his, his skin torn apart everywhere, he's dehydrated, hungry. And then they make him carry his own cross that would have weighed well over 100 pounds. And he had to carry it 200 yards. Jesus had to carry the cross to football fields after being beaten horribly. And then they laid Jesus on the cross and and they drove nails into his wrists. And these weren't ordinary nails. These were seven inch long nails that were like a half inch in diameter. And so these were big nails. And as they beat them into his wrists, the Romans were so good at crucifying people, making sure that it was full of torture and pain, they would make sure that they would hit the median nerve, which would then shoot horrific pain all the way to Jesus' shoulders and into his neck. And then they lifted up the cross and they rested him like on this seat. So like a very small seat where he's awkwardly sitting in humiliation, half naked, bleeding, nailed to a cross. And on top of all of that, he had a crown of thorns put on his head as a symbol of of mockery. The Romans were claiming that we killed the king of the Jews. Can you imagine the humiliation that Jesus was experiencing? I mean, from king to crucifixion. And my question is this, why? Why did Jesus, the one who created the universe, who was in perfect relationship with God, who is not confined by time, who had all power and authority, why did Jesus give up all of that? Why did Jesus give up his heavenly crown for a crown of thorns? Why? And the answer is simple. He did it for you. Jesus humbled himself for you. He died for you. 
I mean, Jesus was sent on a rescue mission by God, and he never once took his eyes off that mission. His focus was always on saving you. Every single one of us, his focus was on saving you. Is there any greater example of humility than Jesus? No. There is no greater of example of, of a greater example of humility than Jesus. He sets the standard for our humility. And that's why Paul, in verse 5, he says this. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. The same humility that Christ showed when he left his kingdom to come to earth is the exact same humility that you and I are supposed to share with one another. We are supposed to be humble, looking at the person of Jesus Christ, emulating the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us how to do that. He says in verse 3, he says, do nothing, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And so when you and I act towards another person, we are not supposed to be in our minds, how is this serving me? Because the, the real temptation, there is a huge temptation for us to do good things so that we look great, so that we look awesome. And this is, a, this is a problem for me. Like it is very hard for me to just even open the door for someone without thinking, man, I, I hope they realize how nice of a person I am because I'm opening the door for them. Or I can't tell you how many times I have treated my wife with love but it, love wasn't really the reason. It was because I wanted her to think of me as a good husband or I wanted everyone else to look at me and think, man, Blaze is a great husband. Like, that's the temptation. So when, when you are doing something for someone, are you doing it for yourself? I mean, when you serve and you love the people around you, are you doing it for yourself? Because Jesus never once acted for himself. Not his entire life. He never acted for himself. It was always for the glory of God and obedience to God. And it was always for you. Or are you serving people because you genuinely love them? Because you see them as someone that is valued and, and created by God? Are you doing it to serve him? He then says in verse 4, he says, Rather, in humility, value, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Every concern that you have for yourself, because Jesus and, and Paul, he's not, he's not asking us to be doormats. He's not asking us just to be people that get walked over. That's, that's not Paul's point. But what he is saying is that every concern that you have for yourself needs to be applied to the people around you. Where you are looking out, intentionally looking to serve other people's needs. We need to be people that are on high alert to serve and to love the people around us, whether we like them or we don't. We need to be people that don't focus on ourselves, but our focus is on everyone else. And if this humility, the same humility that Christ had, if this humility becomes true of you, the same thing that happened to Christ will happen to you. It will lead to your death. And I'm not talking about physical death, but I'm talking about your death to self, where, where you are only concerned about your needs and your wants. But now because you have died to self, it is now Christ that is living in you. Blaze no longer exists. It is Christ that is living in me. 
for we are concerned with the needs of others above our own. And once this happens, once we become humble, once humility becomes a part of us because we are looking at the person of Jesus, two beautiful things will happen. The first one is this, unity will happen. You will begin to notice that in your family, in the relationships with your family, you are starting to become more unified, more tight-knit, because now you are not concerned about your needs, you are concerned about their needs. In your relationships with your coworkers, they will begin to flourish because you don't just see them as coworkers or employees, but now you see them as people that are loved and created by God. And in my opinion, the best part of this, and Paul speaks to this, is that you will notice that your relationships with, peop with people at church will become more unified. Because now you are more concerned about serving the people around you than serving yourself. You don't come to church thinking about yourself. I hope they play my favorite song. I hope this pastor is speaking. I hope the message really speaks to me. But instead, you are coming to church thinking about other people. How can I serve other people? How can I love for and care for the people that are sitting next to me? We are one body unified in Christ, functioning together. And Jesus himself, he talked about unity all the time and his desire for unity. And the thing that Jesus said was, he said that the world will know me by the way that you love one another. Meaning that salvation is on the line. People will know Jesus by the way that we interact and treat one another. Salvation is on the line. Do we understand what is at risk here? And isn't it true that our world desperately needs unity? I mean, we are living in a time of horrible dysfunction. I mean, what if, what if the church was different? What if the church set the example for unity? Like, what if the world looked at us and thought, wow, they are so unified, we want to be like them, and then that leads them to Christ? I mean, think about what our love for one another means for this world. Man, where we are praying for one another, where we are caring for one another. You know, the early church, they would, they would literally sell their possessions, sell the things that they worked for, sell the things that they love to take care of other people in the church. What if we, what if we saw that unity and we're like, man, we, we want that unity. Or we love for and care for every single person. Man, the first thing that you're gonna see through humility is unity. And then the second thing that is going to happen is that you will have the amazing privilege of seeing Jesus be exalted. Look at Philippians 2, 9 through 11. It says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is going to be exalted above every name. Above every name. And every knee, every knee, those under the earth, meaning those who don't believe in Jesus, and those who do, every knee is going to bow at the feet of Jesus because he is king. I mean, can you imagine, because we will all be there one day. This will be a reality for all of us. Can you just imagine being there, bowing before Jesus with everyone that has ever existed 
And as you are bowing, wouldn't it be amazing if in that moment you knew that you gave up everything here on earth to serve and to love and to be humble to the people around you? Let's be people that grow in humility together. That grow in unity together. So that the name of Jesus will be proclaimed forever and ever. Now and for eternity. We do not have to be people that just go through the motions of life. But we have a purpose here. To serve and to love the same way that Christ served and loved. So let's grow in humility by, by f- not focusing on ourselves, not focusing how can I change, how can I be better, but focusing on the person of Jesus. Let me pray. Jesus, there is no sweeter name than the name of Jesus. Jesus, I pray over us right now that we would be a people that died to ourselves, that put other people first, that put each other first. Jesus, you are the perfect example of humility. Thank you for being that perfect example. Thank you for being sinless. Thank you for dying on a cross, a death that you did not deserve, a death that I deserve, a death that we deserved. Thank you for doing that in humility. Jesus, you knew no sin and you became sin for the righteousness of us all so that we could all be brought into the the family of God. I cannot wait for the moment where I am bowing people from Brookside Church at the feet of Jesus, exalting him as king. And so God, would we right now, would we join the angels who are already singing, would we sing praises to your name because you are so worthy of all of it. It's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen.